This podcast includes descriptions of sexual abuse. Listener discretion is advised. There's a lot of people who are abused in the church that the church is doing their best to avoid. Geez, I'm out here for at least a dozen others who will not speak of what happened to them publicly. So I figure if I'm able to speak, I probably should. John T. McGuire, better known as Tim McGuire, is protesting in front of St. Patrick Church in downtown Mystic to bring awareness to the ongoing sexual abuse cases brought against the Roman Catholic Diocese of Norwich. This has had an enormously awful effect on too many people to think that they don't have a responsibility to us. There's people dying. There's actual blood on the bishop's hands. People have committed suicide. Uh, What more do the victims need to do? I don't know, other than make a stink at this point. Thank you. Tim has been known to protest in front of various Catholic churches in southeastern Connecticut in solidarity with victims of these crimes. Tim is one of those victims. Uh, I believe I was around seven or eight years old. I'm only guessing. And it was in St. Joseph's Church in Noank, where everybody knew everybody, and everybody I knew was an altar boy, and that's what I was shooting for. And when I showed up to find out what an altar boy was, I found out a little more than I bargained for. This is Cost of Silence, and I'm Carlos Virgen. This podcast series is produced by The Day, an independently owned news organization in New London, Connecticut. The series will delve into the impact of sexual abuse cases in a Roman Catholic diocese in Connecticut. We'll look to uncover what is the psychological, emotional, physical, spiritual, and financial costs associated with these horrendous crimes. In this episode, we'll explore the long-lasting effects on the victims, most of whom were first abused when they were young children. People like Tim. It just, uh, he took advantage of me, and I was scared enough to go back a few times because, uh, well, you're just scared. You know, it's God's right hand, man. You don't mess with him. He tells you to do something, you do it. The late Reverend James Curry served as a priest at St. Joseph's Church in Noank, a shoreline village in the town of Groton. And about the fourth time, I think, I just, I think I left uh, crying and went and hid behind the firehouse. My brother had to come find me. The church is part of the Diocese of Norwich that encompasses four counties in Connecticut and part of one county in New York State. The diocese owns four high schools and nine elementary and middle schools, with a total student population served of around 3,500. Tim McGuire's older brothers and friends were altar boys at St. Joseph's when he asked Reverend Curry, who was beloved by his mother and grandparents, if he could become an altar boy. Tim says that on four occasions, Curry took him into the room next to the altar, where the priest undressed the boy and fondled him. Afterwards, Tim says he was made to confess to Reverend Curry that he had tempted the priest. I didn't uh, didn't tell anybody until until I told a church counselor at St. Mary's here in New London. My wife and I were down there for help with some food and some... uh, we were really having a hard time struggling with uh, finances. And I had told her during one of the sessions that we were talking to her about the finances, and I said, I'd really like to talk to the bishop or somebody about it, and uh, never did hear back from him. That was 13 years ago, I think. I think it was 2011. Uh, when I was younger, I was scared of him. That's a guy who can cut off communication between you and God. That's a powerful dude. I was scared shitless, and I was crying and in tears a lot. Um, I was scared. 
really scared, and I couldn't see him. I couldn't be anywhere near him. Tim wasn't the only person with allegations against Curry. In 2008, a former church cleaning woman filed a lawsuit against the Diocese of Norwich, claiming that the late Curry had sexually abused her eight-year-old daughter starting in 1966. The abuse occurred over eight years and involved hundreds of sexual assaults. And news coverage of that 2008 lawsuit resurfaced previous allegations against Curry. He was the devil to me. You're right in the church. You're God's right-hand man. Wow. He told me after I told him that I didn't want to do this anymore, that I was not what God was looking for. So whether that meant that I wasn't got what God was looking for to be an altar boy or whether I wasn't what God was looking for, period, was at the time indiscernible to me. Um, I wasn't what God was looking for, period, was what I gathered in any form. Don't come to my church. Don't ask me. For, don't pray to me. I'm not going to hear you. I mean, this this is really, really spiritually destructive stuff that they do. It isn't just a one fell swoop and somebody stuck something in your ear. You know what I mean? Uh, this is an insidious thing that keeps on pecking away at you every day, every day. News coverage of that 2008 lawsuit resurfaced previous allegations against Curry. In 1981, a woman who had worked as Curry's housekeeper filed a criminal complaint against Curry with police. In it, she alleged the priest had on various occasions raped her 11-year-old daughter. In 2008, Tim read the resurfaced details about that older case. The story of that girl's abuse is what caused him guilt and prompted him to speak up. I wasn't going to tell anybody. I was, I was going to go to the grave with it. I really was. I didn't plan on telling anybody. I had done my best to... You can't make it go away. It's there every day. Every, every, every day, whether you want it to be or not. But I did my best to... Uh, just to not bring it up and make it any worse. And I finally saw an article in the paper about a young lady who was molested in the church right up the street from where I was, it just happened to be the same priest, and I effectively blew a rod at that point. <laughs> I was not going to be quiet anymore. I mean, it, it, I think what, what hurt me the most at that point was that I wasn't able to say something and stop him from doing it to her. That's So this extra layer of guilt was on, on top of everything. It just made it awful. When he decided at age 48 to reveal what had happened to him, Tim discovered that he had missed the deadline to file a lawsuit by three weeks. The law in the state of Connecticut says that you are not permitted to file a sexual abuse claim, a civil lawsuit for damages, if you were abused when you were a child um, after you turned 48. The law is 30 years after the age of majority. Kelly Reardon is a New London attorney who represents 25 of the victims in the case against the Norwich Diocese. He actually came to us, before I was even a lawyer, he came to my firm, but it was a couple days after he, he turned 48 years old. Why should he have been precluded from seeking compensation for what happened to him? Because he, he, for the first time in his entire life, told somebody and walked into a law firm a few days after he turned 48. It makes absolutely no sense. I know guys uh, whose friends have killed themselves. I know guys who live in one-lung apartments, never got married, never had kids. Um, they'll cr a grown man, cr they'll start crying at the drop of a hat talking about this. Uh, it ruined them. It ruined them. You don't leave an eight-year-old with nowhere, nobody to talk to. You, you don't rape eight-year-olds and then just tell them, you know what, deal with it. You don't. I mean, full-grown adults are raped and they're not able to handle it. What the hell do they think is going to happen with an eight-year-old kid? I beat up other kids. I got in trouble, like you read about. I was sent home from school. I'm throwing rocks at people's heads. I'm skipping classes. The teachers can't understand why. If his test so high is IQ, why isn't this kid learning? Um, made to see a psychologist once a week every day at school because they don't know what's going on with me. Um, that's just elementary school, right? 
by the time I get into junior high school and high school, I have found my way to drugs and alcohol and illicit behavior. And a lot of people don't understand how it could affect your whole life. They understand how it could, how it could affect you. And a lot of people think that that's something, uh, you know, maybe the old bootstraps are involved when you just need to pull on them harder. And uh, when you're walking around with that much anger at, you know, eight years old and every day afterwards over what happened to you and the fact that you can't talk to anybody about it and that you still got to go to church and see this guy and now he's gone and molested somebody else. Um, I hurt other people because of it. I was angry. I was not nice. Um, I was removed. I never had a girlfriend until I was a senior in high school. I was still trying to figure out whether I was gay or not. I didn't. I didn't know what this guy did to me, or what I was, or what I did to me. I have no idea. Um, took me a long time to figure that out. I was some sort of abomination for a while, and it took me a long time to figure that out. But the anger is what hurt me, I think, the most. I've hurt myself physically and tried to drown it out with, you know, various chemicals and liquids and whatever else I could get my hands on to keep my mind off of it. I was an altar boy, so I went to Sacred Heart for uh, eight years, and I was an altar boy. Oh, and Father Father Manny shows up in 78, and he starts a youth group. He said he wants to uh, get all the kids together to get them more involved. John Waddington of Groton alleges he was sexually assaulted by a former priest named Charles Manny of Sacred Heart Church in Groton in 1978 when he was a 14-year-old altar boy. And he kept bugging me to come watch a movie with the youth group, and I, I didn't want anything to do with it, but I figured he, he was bugging me so much, I figured, well, I'll go once, and then the guy will leave me alone, which was my big mistake. And then so we get back to the rectory at Sacred Heart, and it's just me, and then he puts on the Exorcist movie, and then during this movie, I'm sexually assaulted. But then I didn't remember it for 14 years, which is... Which is strange. It's kind of like since I didn't, this is what the psychiatrist said, because it happened when I was 14 and then I didn't deal with it or didn't come into my conscious till I was 28, that a part of me was left behind back there. You know what I mean? And sometimes it comes back if I get really upset. In 2001, he was awarded $850,000 by a jury. But a judge overturned the verdict and ordered a new trial because the judge said that she should not have allowed testimony by Manny that he was involved in a sexual relationship with a 16-year-old boy seven years after Waddington. Uh, well, I suffer from um, depression, post-traumatic stress. People should realize the same people that are baptizing your kids and giving you first communion and 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 having you get married and 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 saying your parents funeral they're the same people that are that are um, sexually abusing your kids and let them get away with it all these years and and if you're going to, and if you're going to church and giving them money then you're somehow condoning this I'm hoping by by doing this Waddington did not seek a second trial as the religious order to which Manny belonged had been removed from the lawsuit and Waddington would not be able to collect much money from Manny, who had denied the allegations. Several studies, including one from 2012 titled The Economic Burden of Child Sexual Abuse in the United States, published by Letourneau, Brown, Fang et al., have shown the direct financial burden caused to victims of child abuse, including victims of sexual abuse. The study shows that victims see a loss of productivity, they incur expensive medical and mental health care costs, as well as costs for social and emergency services, and of course, the intangible costs, like the loss of quality of life.
you know, I don't know where I'd be if I kept going to church. Church is a nice network. You find people who will help you out, who work with you, who help you with jobs and education and things like that and mentoring. So I didn't, I didn't get that. So it's not like uh, anything other than a void, if you know what I mean there. It's not uh, that I can put my finger on what was. It's kind of what wasn't. Um, I didn't have a lot of that opportunity in front of me. When you run from the church, you run from everything in it. And there's some good things in the church, you know. When you talk about the people. But... Can't hold a job. Uh, you know, it's hard to put it into words. But if you can't get up in the morning, what do you think that's going to do for you making money in this world? You know what I mean? How How is it you're not going to struggle if you... You're going to struggle if you can't get up and go to work. You're going to. <laughs> and uh, whether it's school or work or social interaction, a lot of these people don't talk to anybody. This guy I was talking to you about who lives in a one-lunger apartment, I, you know, he don't he's talk to anybody. These people are removed. Their, their full-time job is to deal with the trauma. It's not to have a career and make sure that you got bread on the table. That comes after. The traumas open your eyes. You don't see the missing loaf of bread in your kitchen. You see the trauma you got to deal with again today. Then you can go in and find out you need bread, you know? And, oh, geez, what am I going to do? I don't have any money, you know? It's back there on the list. It's supposed to be way up front, and it's just pushed way back on the list. It's... uh there's other things jumping out in front of it. There's trauma. I was talking to my wife about that. You know, I, I don't think that it would be so bad if I just didn't have to struggle. I have to struggle just to survive right now. And I, I see these guys, uh, you know, in all their riches. And it's like, why? Why am I struggling? Why aren't the people who did this and allowed this to happen struggling? So... I think that's my point, is just to put the struggle where it belongs. We've struggled enough, and they owe, they owe us for what remains of our life. They've taken, to date, things that can't be replaced, but they owe us for what remains in our life. They'll never be able to pay us for what they took. You want me to add it up? How many days? How many hours? You charge them, what, 10 cents a minute? What do you want me to charge them? I mean, it's... They'll never be able to pay for what they did to me and the others. Um, it's devastating, debilitating stuff. And for the church to stand there and not have a comment on it or not to think that they owe anybody anything and now we forced their hand into bankruptcy. Why, because you ignored us for 70 years and molested our friends? <laughs> it's, it's about as nonsensical as it gets, but that's what they're saying. Is uh, we've made it to here without paying you. Let's see how much further we can get without you taking everything we own. And it's like, you know, it, is there any remorse? And that you any shame? I'm not seeing it. The Roman Catholic Diocese of Norwich plans to sell St. Bernard School a private co-ed school located in Montville, Connecticut, and the 113 acres of land it sits on to help fund its proposed bankruptcy plan. In addition, the plan states that Xavier High School, an all-boys Catholic school located in Middletown, Connecticut, will be sold with proceeds contributed to the Victims Fund. When it filed for bankruptcy in 2021, the diocese estimated its assets at between $10 and $50 million dollars, and its liabilities between 50 and 100 million dollars. Details of the bankruptcy case will be explored in coming episodes. The committee that represents the 142 people who say they were sexually assaulted by priests and clergy in the diocese have said the 29 million dollar bankruptcy plan to compensate the victims is quote woefully inadequate. Some of the victims could receive as little as $2500 according to the diocese plan including those individuals like Tim, who are unable to bring suit because of the statute of limitations. 
sort of makes you feel like you're being treated like a leper. Like we're being sacrificed. Like this is a modern day sacrifice you're watching. We're not on the altar. We're not burning. Our heads aren't rolling down some Mayan stairway into a crowd, but we're being sacrificed for the greater good. And I don't know that there might be one out of 142, but I doubt it. It's okay with that. Um, we feel like we're being sacrificed, like we're being treated like lepers, outcasts. Speak and you'll be ignored. I'll turn the people against you, the followers, the faithful, which they have. And then uh, I get people who intermittently try, try to help and give me work, you know, here, do a little job. And one of them showed me the prayer they say for me at St. Mary's over here in New London. And it's interesting, they pray for the salvation of me and the other victims, but I don't see anything in that prayer about the guys who did it. They don't mention them. They're just praying for us, and that goes unmentioned. And the unmentioned is what's killing us. It's uh, why we're here today, why it's such a hot mess. I take, I'll take take a kick in the key teeth all day long. And nobody waits better than me. Nobody takes a punch better than me. I, I'm, uh, I'm good at it. But that's... Uh, I think that's, you know... It, it's insulting, though. You know, when you're in possession of hundreds of millions of dollars in assets and you're offering one victim $2,500, you walk away with your Lincoln town car and all your uh, accoutrements and I get two twenty five hundred bucks and I got to, what, pay taxes on it too? <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's unacceptable. It's far, far from what needs to be done. And they know that. I think for the most part, if you want the message to be out there, you have to go out there and shove it down people's throats because this is one of the biggest taboo topics there are that I know of in the world, is religion. And people don't touch their religion. They don't poke their religion. They don't poke their God in the eye. And that's what I'm effectively doing to a lot of these people is I'm out in front of their church poking their own God right in the eye. So I didn't expect a warm welcome. I didn't get one. But the messages were clear, you know. I talk to God every single day of my life, whether I want to or not. Every day. Um... I don't know why. I spend a lot of time apologizing to him. Because I'm not the greatest person in the world. I, I, I'm not perfect. I'm a garden variety sinner. But I don't have any intermediary to go to. So it's just me and him or her. It's a little intimidating. And it's worse if I don't. So... I have religion, but it takes place in, in my house and in my mind. And not in any stone building. Not with any gold chalices or anything. No robes. No heirs. You know, if he's there, he's hearing me. If he's not, well, I'm going to give it a good shot. <laughs> If you or someone you know has been a victim of sexual abuse or assault, you can contact the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests at 877-SNAP-HEALS. That's 877-762-7432. You can also contact the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network at 800-656-4673 and the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 800 800- Seven nine nine seven two three three. 
The audio from the John Waddington interview was part of a 2018 video produced by The Day. We checked back in with Waddington. He told us he started a new relationship with a woman who helped him change his outlook, or as he said, quote, kind of beat some sense into me. As he nears his 60th birthday and with a 40 plus year career at Electric Boat, the region's booming submarine manufacturer, he says his anger has subsided. But he is represented by a Florida law firm as the Diocese of Norwich bankruptcy proceedings continue. Cost of Silence is a production of the day. Production, editing, and music by me, Carlos Virgen. It is co-produced by Karen Florin and Joe Woges. The series relies on the extensive reporting done by Joe Woges, staff writer and editor at The Day. The Day's executive editor is Isaskun Larañeta, and our managing editor is Karen Florin.